Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on a Chapter 8 of the Kathy Schwalbe uh, textbook, An Introduction to Project Management, 7th edition. And Chapter 8 is about monitoring and controlling projects. So let's get started. Uh, the learning objectives is something I'm uh, are or something I'm going to allow you to read for yourselves, as I typically do. Um, and the, the beginning part of this lecture and the slides that go along with it and the chapter uh, from the textbook, they're pretty well geared towards the PMI curriculum uh, that's been pretty steadily the same for quite a while and is primarily based upon the traditional or waterfall approach. We have some comments at the end that relate to um, the Agile approach. And as we go through, if I see something that uh, would apply to Agile as well, I'll, I'll try to make some uh, a note. So uh, monitoring and controlling is one of the uh, process areas for the PMI curriculum. So it involves regularly measuring progress to ensure that the project is meeting its objectives and addressing current business needs. The project manager and other staff monitor progress against plans and take corrective actions when necessary. Okay, and now we have uh, here a graphic that comes out of the uh, PMI body of knowledge, and it is. Um, it's uh, taking the 10 knowledge areas and it's saying, okay, when we're doing monitoring and controlling, uh, we're in that process group, what are all the things that we do, right? What are all the processes, the sub, uh, sub uh, processes, and then what are the outputs from them? Okay, and I think we have two slides for this. And in the main, I'm going to leave you to read this on your own. Um, I find that, well, for sure, if you're going to go for your PMP certification with PMI, you're going to need to understand these things in these kinds of terms. Okay, I also think that the PMI scheme is a good way to understand formal project management. OK, it seems like it would be a lot to memorize. And I think it is a lot to memorize, but it's not too much to understand. So the first of the knowledge areas that uh, PMI has identified is this project integration management, which I kind of call the secret sauce. It's pulling everything uh, together. So the main monitoring and controlling processes perform as part of integration include monitoring and controlling project work and performing integrated change control. These are crucial processes that must be done well to ensure project success. So when you really think about this, the project manager is going to be walking around the project every day and uh, monitoring and controlling the work, just having having a uh, a commanding uh, knowledge of what's uh, going on on the project and how it compares to a uh, plan. Then the other thing is uh, the project manager is going to understand the changes that either have either already happened or in the process of happening. What change has happened or is afoot? Um, one really useful tool that's pretty technical, that's covered in the, the chapter, we, ha we have a, a series of slides on it here. Uh, it's called Earn Value Management. 
And I'm a big fan of earned value management. I've used it on the job with great success. Um, and we're going to talk about it. And then I think at the very end, we're going to talk about who's using it these uh, days. Certainly not everybody uses it, but people do. Okay, especially uh, people working on really big uh, projects and projects that they're doing uh, for government agencies. Okay, so this is something you want to know about for sure. So earned value management EVM is a project performance measurement technique that integrates scope, time and cost data. Given a baseline, project managers and their teams can it, it determine how well the project is meeting scope, time, and cost goals by entering actual information and then comparing it to the baseline. Now, I just want to uh, throw in a little bit of commentary here. One of the tough things about trying to manage a project, especially a big one, uh, but really any project, is that uh, you draw up uh, plans, okay, um, and you draw up estimates, and nothing ever really happens as planned. For instance, you think that you're going to start on G uh, June the 1st, but they don't allow you to start until August the 15th. You think that you're going to get a certain kind of staff for the project. They don't have that staff. They give you a different one. Maybe they have the same capabilities, but they're more expensive, right? Um, it goes on and on and on. So one of the things that you would think that you would be able to do is you would just say, oh, okay, as I go to the project, I'll just compare where we were expecting to be with where we are. Well, that might be possible if you started exactly when you thought you were going to start. You got all the resources you thought you were going to get. There have been no big changes, all that kind of stuff. Most of the things that turn out to be different from the plan values are confounding. And so you get to the point where it's very hard to answer questions about how well you're doing. Earned value management is particularly good at kind of boiling that all down and separating out the components such that you can explain to people how well you're doing on the cost, how well you're doing on the schedule, okay? Um, and it, I have found it personally one of the best ways to be able to explain to financial stakeholders how well we're doing. And um, it's a good way to get their uh, confidence and their buy-in. Okay? Um, so the baseline information in includes scope uh, data. And here we say a WBS uh, test, but you have to remember that we said a couple of chapters ago that there are no tests on the WBS. So perhaps what we mean is that the tasks we identified in the schedule that are organized by the WBS categories. I hope that's what we mean because I hope we read that earlier chapter. We have time data, start and finish estimates for each uh, task. We have cost uh, data, cost estimates for each uh, task. So in traditional kind of waterfall uh, projects, if you're using a traditional tool to uh, plan and track them, something like a Microsoft project is a very affordable instance of that. Um, you can actually have costs right down to each task. Okay, because you say how long it is and you say what the resources that you're going to use are and you know how much the resources uh, cost and the tool does the multiplication for you. And so uh, for each uh, task or group uh, of tasks, the tool can add it up for you. 
Note that you can use earned value management at either a detailed or a summary level. So I just said that you could get costs at a detail or a summary level and you can uh, you can do this analysis at a detailed task or maybe a more aggregated kind of level. So there are a lot of uh, terms in earned value management and that um, that'll uh, give quite a few people a dazed look. But when you understand them and you kind of work with them for a bit, they take on a meaning that's helpful, okay? So here are some of the terms. Plan value. It's the authorized budget assigned to schedule work. So each uh, task, it, because it had a, an agreed to uh, a duration and resources, it has, a, uh, it, has, it has the cost in that plan. And that cost is called the plan value for that task. And of course, if you aggregate it up above the task, that's the plan value for that uh, WBS item. The actual cost, AC, is the realized cost incurred for the work performed on an activity during a specific time period. Now, one interesting thing here is that you can only track the actual costs at, say, the task level if you report your time at that kind of level, okay? If you report your time at a more uh, aggregated kind of level, well, then you only be able to do earned value management at that level. Uh, the earned value is the measure of the work performed expressed in terms of the budget authorized for the work. It cannot be greater than the authorized plan value budget for a component as it is calculated as the sum of the plan value of the completed work. Okay, so when you complete the work, um, you get the plan value amount as your earned value. And we'll see in a couple of minutes when we see a slide. There are some teams that uh, that accumulate earned uh, uh, value uh, kind of all all at once. Either a task is complete or it's not, and uh, until it's complete, you get zero of the earned value, and when it's complete, you get a hundred percent of it. There are other teams that will report a percentage complete, say twenty five percent or. 50%, and they'll take credit for a percentage of that earned value. The teams that only count uh, their earned value when the task is 100% complete, well, they're measuring things in a more conservative uh, kind of way. So here are uh, formulas. Okay, and uh, for instance, if you're a person who's interested in getting your PMP certification, uh, this is on the test. Um, you might ask, well, how could you remember all these formulas? And the answer is, you create a cheat sheet, and you memorize the cheat sheet. And the first thing you do when you get into the exam uh, is you reproduce the cheat sheet, okay? And then you can refer to the cheat sheet, all right? That's what I did. That's what I've coached uh, people to do for years. It seems to work pretty well. So plan value, the formula is the authorized budget assigned to the scheduled work. So that's the task or tasks um, at their... Uh, budgeted original authorized uh, cost, okay? Uh, the earned value is uh, the plan of value of all completed work. It can also include partially completed work if your team wants to take a more aggressive 
a, a posture about what's earned. And again, in particular places, they either take partial credit along the way or they don't. Okay. Um, uh, one of the one of the things that I've always said to organizations that I've been responsible for is we're only going to take a credit when it's 100% complete. So that means we need to plan the tasks fairly small. Okay. And then when they're 100% done, we'll take 100% of the earned value. Um, so there isn't a line here for AC, actual cost. Okay. So the actual cost is what you've accumulated in terms of cost against that piece of work uh, in your accounting system. Okay. So that would be uh, people on the team would bill hours against that task. Okay. And if you had, if you uh, bought things related to that task, you would charge them against the task. Okay. So when you were done, uh, charging hours and uh, materials and expenses and all that kind of stuff against the task, you would have the AC, you'd have the actual uh, cost. So um, those three values give you a lot of analytical tools, okay? So let's think about this. The cost variance is the earned value minus the actual cost. Okay, so if you do it, if the actual cost is the is the original uh, plan cost, well, then the cost of variance is zero. If you overran the cost, then the cost variance is negative. And typically, when we're we're doing this kind of managerial accounting, we set things up such that. Uh, negative values are uh, bad or we say unfavorable. Okay, so if our actual cost is higher than our plan cost, well, then we have a negative cost variance. Schedule variance. Okay, so the schedule variance is equal to the um, earned value minus the plan value, okay? So um, we, might have, we might have planned to, at this point in the, the project, in the calendar, we might have planned to have half the project done. And let's say it's a million dollar project, okay? So we would think that at this point, our earned value would be $500,000, okay? Uh, but maybe we started late, okay? And our earned value is, almost, uh, is only $250,000. Well, that's uh, unfavorable by $250,000. That's a schedule variance. So one of the things that you can see here is that this starts to pull out the threads uh, that are very hard to find in a project um, because you you rarely start exactly when you thought you were going to, to, to start. Things rarely cost exactly what you thought they were going to cost to, you know, to build them. And uh, the resources, uh, rarely uh, are costing you exactly what you thought that they were going to cost. And so these formulas help you pull out, okay, I know I have a big variance, but what if it's coming from cost and what's coming from schedule? Maybe I started early, maybe I started late. Okay, and what's interesting about looking at the schedule uh, variance is, um, you could have already spent a lot more than you thought you would have spent at this point, but you may be way ahead. 
So you may have a schedule variance that's unfavorable and a cost of variance that's uh, favorable. Okay, and that I've always been really just encouraged by the fact that um, when you come to know all these variables and you become uh, comfortable with these uh, uh, indexes and variances and all that kind of stuff, you can really pull things apart and you can explain to people um, how good they should feel about how the project is actually doing. Because there's a lot of, again, if you don't start when you thought you were going to start and things aren't taking as long as you thought and the resources are not being charged at the rates that you thought, um, it's hard to explain to people what you're doing well on and what you're doing poorly on. But this allows you to get a handle on it and explain it to people and financial people love this. Then we have the cost performance index, okay? That's the earned value over the actual cost, okay? So if the actual cost is higher than the earned value, then it's costing more than we thought, okay? So the cost performance index, because the denominator is the actual cost, as as our cost as as the cost overruns get higher this cpi goes uh, down so these are engineered such that if we're right on plan they're 1.0 if we're doing better than plan more favorable they're above 1.0 and to the extent that we're doing worse than plan they're below 1.0 so a 0.75 would be bad. A 1.25 would be great. And then you have the schedule performance index. Okay. And that, again, a lot of the times this has to do with just when you are allowed to start the project. Right. Uh, that's the earned value over the planned value. Okay. And if the earned value is higher than the planned value, well, then it's uh, favorable. Uh, it's above 1.0. Uh, if they're equal, well, then it's 1. If the earned value is less than the planned uh, value, then it's less than 1. Now, here's a really interesting thing. We have this EAC, estimate at completion. So... Um, uh, we take the budget at uh, completion. This is what we think the whole project was going to cost when we budgeted this out. Okay. And so we take uh, uh, the budget at completion divided by the cost performance index. So we say, here's what we say. Uh, um, we say, um, if we continue to perform the way we have uh, performed up until now, this is what it will cost us when we're done. Now, do we always uh, continue to perform the same way? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. Uh, the project management is about a lot of things but one thing it's really about is intervention okay so if things are going badly well it's incumbent upon us to intervene and make uh, changes that will change the track okay so uh, what is interesting on uh, something like this is is just uh, what value are, are you going to use for the cost performance index going forward? Okay, are you just going to assume that uh, things are going to continue the same way? And the estimate uh, to complete is uh, uh, the estimate at a completion minus the actual cost. So if now we think that overall, uh, we're going to, it's going to cost us uh, $2 million, and the actual cost right now is $1.5 million. Well, it's going to cost us another $500,000. And I guess I 
I have to say, when you look at this, you could get your head kind of swimming around, okay? Uh, but I have to tell you that this is worth the investment if you're managing a large project where there's a lot of money at stake. Because um, in order to keep... Mm, uh, in order to continue the project, uh, whoever's paying the bills needs uh, competence in your management. And one of the big inputs to that is going to be what the financial advisors are telling the, the sponsor. And this stuff it appeals to financial people in a big way. OK, and it can help you get their confidence that you understand what's going on in the project. And that confidence uh, will be shared with the sponsor who's paying the bills. And that sponsor will get a warmer feeling about you as the project manager and your organization as the the organization doing the project. So it's really interesting to see these values in these uh, these these uh, time versus uh, cost uh, graphs. Okay, so here is a project over its lifespan. Um, uh, we have a project budget. OK, uh, that is right here. So we think that it's going to cost whatever that line is. OK, um, and that's the budget at uh, uh, complete. Oh, so we have the budget at completion. If management, senior management, wants to add on a management reserve, well, they can. They're entitled to add on money before they promise their superiors. OK, so that might be the management reserve. OK. Um, uh, then this line here right in the middle is saying it's the data date so it's where we are right now okay so we have this line for actual cost this would probably be a little bit easier to read if it was in more than one color uh so we have this line for actual cost which stops at the, at the current date because we're just projecting it from there okay now What's interesting is if we don't change anything on, on the project, we don't change the staffing or at the rate of which we're spending, well, we'd, we'd, we'd expect the curve to keep on going in the same direction. And then we have the plan value. That is, we look at our original schedule and budget, and we can just uh, uh, calculate uh, when we're expecting things to be done and what the planned value is at any point along the time uh, dimension. And then, of course, the earned value is uh, what we've uh, completed. So if we look at this particular graph, you can see that we're tracking behind our end value is tracking behind our planned value and our actual cost is tracking uh, higher than our planned value and this would essentially say that we're in trouble okay now there are projects where you start early Right, and so your actual costs are higher than you would thought that you know that uh, they would be at this uh, time, but then your earned value should be higher than the planned uh, value. The fact that the actual cost is higher than planned and the earned value is less than planned, this is looking kind of sketchy. Um, here's a, a scenario, okay. Uh, this is one week into the project, 
Okay, we have earned value $5,000, planned value $5,000. So uh, the work that we planned, we were going to complete, we complete it. Its original uh, value, according to the estimates that we had, it was uh, $5,000. So when we complete it, we get the credit at that rate, $5,000. But our actual cost was $6,000. That leads to a cost variance of $1,000 negative because it's unfavorable. We overran the cost. The schedule variance is zero. The cost performance index is uh, 83 and a third percent. Okay, that's because we overran the, the cost. But the schedule performance index is 100% uh, percent because we're right on having earned what we expect to earn. So you can see how, how you can tease things apart with this. Um, so in general, negative numbers for costs and schedule variance indicate problems in those areas. They're unfavorable. Negative numbers mean the project is costing more than planned or taking longer than planned. Likewise, these index, the cost performance index and the schedule performance index less than one or less than 100% uh, indicate problems. So you can express them as uh, decimal fractions, in which case uh, it, uh, it would be 1.0 or a percentage, in which case it'd be 100%. Um, so how many people are using this? Okay, I, and I have to say, again, I've used it. I've used it a lot. I'm a believer. Okay, would I use it for small projects? Maybe not. I had people do it on on small projects in, in order to be ready for large projects. So I had them do it on all the projects that we were doing for a fixed price. Okay, um, because how could we know how much of the fixed price we had earned? Okay, well, earned value management. That's the only way that I could tell our financial uh, people how much of the fixed fee that we were being paid, they could k take a credit for on the company's financial statements. Okay, so I'm a believer. Okay, so who else other than Kevin is going to recommend this to you? Well, uh, PMI conducted a study in 2011 to see who was using it. They surveyed more than 600 management practitioners in 61 countries. They found it's used worldwide. It's popular in the Middle East, South Asia, Canada, and Europe. Now, they haven't mentioned the U.S., um, but I believe they still use it on U.S. Uh, government contracts. Most countries require EVM for large uh, defense or government uh, projects. That includes the U.S., I'm sure. Project budget size appears to be the most important factor in deciding whether or not to use EVM. And I would say so, too. I, would, I only had people using it on smaller projects because I wanted them to get uh, good at it while the stakes were low. And here's some data on who's using it. So defense and government. Um, uh, large and critical projects on defense and government, 50%. Uh, Organization-wide standard for all projects, 30%. A few pilot projects, 20%. Okay, so uh, big government uh, contracts, uh, it's being used on half of them, according to the to the study. And that, that's pretty consistent with my feel. What I, mm, you know, what I hear people say. 
So budget at completion. So the budget at completion or the approved total budget for the project can be divided by the cost performance index to calculate the estimate at uh, uh, completion, which is a forecast of how much the project will cost upon uh, completion. This calculation assumes that you'll be spending at the same rate as your current level of spending. So I said before, and I'm just going to repeat, if you're having very bad experience on the project so far, okay, well, if you want to use a different uh, cost performance index, well, you have to make the case for it, okay? Maybe you make the case for it by saying, well, look at our cost performance in uh, index over the last month or two months we've turned things around. Okay, well, yeah, so maybe you ought to use that to project out how, how, how much uh, more this is going to cost. But in the absence of being able to, you know, to demonstrate that you have made an intervention in this, in this uh, uh, bad experience, uh, well, then uh, people are just going to extrapolate, extrapolate from the bad history b beginning at the beginning of the project. Likewise, the approved time estimate for the project can be divided by the schedule performance index to calculate when the project will be completed. Earned value therefore provides an excellent way to monitor project performance and provide forecasts based on performance to date. And it just gives you a way to pull out the components and talk about them in a useful way. So here's the sample forecast using an earned value chart. You can graph earned value information to track project performance and to forecast when a project will be completed and for how much. So we have the, have the cost performance index and the schedule performance index. So the cost performance index, index is 0.75. So we're doing badly on costs. Not horribly, but uh, badly. Schedule performance index is up at 1.5. We're doing pretty well. Okay, so um, the estimate and completion, okay, um, is $1.6 million. Okay, it was originally. Um, the budget at completion was 1.2. So now we think we're going to be spending 1.6 million. So we're $400,000 to the bad. Okay. The new time estimate, uh, the original time estimate divided by the schedule performance estimate. So this is 12 months divided by 1.5 is eight months. Okay. So, it could have been that somebody uh, told us that, look, you got to hurry up and we're going to hire you a bunch of uh, consultants from the outside. And it turns out that they cost a lot more than the employees that we were going to use. Uh, but, with the, you know, we sped this thing up. We're getting it done in two thirds of the time. And maybe they know we're going to spend more. Maybe a $400,000 overrun to pick up four months is something that they're uh, glad to buy. It's hard to tell. It depends on, on the organization. And uh, I believe that this is the... Um, this is the... Uh, uh, graph that goes with a uh, scenario that we just saw. So the estimate at completion, 1.6 million. The budget at completion was 1.2. And here is the actual cost. We're uh, uh, 
tracking along here. Um, but we're doing very well on time and bad on cost. And perhaps people are happy about that. At least we can tease out the two things and we can find out whether they are or not. Okay, we're going to take a pause right here. Okay, we're back. Okay, so uh, that's it for earned value management. Let's talk about the kind of reports that uh, a project manager and the team could create during the project while they're performing it, the weather monitoring and, and controlling. Um, I think that the PMI uh, terminology does a really good job of contrasting these three kinds of reports, status reports, progress reports, forecasts. So status reports describe where the project stands at a specific point in time. Okay, what, what's done, what's not done, okay? Progress reports describe what the project team has accomplished during a certain period in time. Okay. And forecasts predict the future project status and progress based on past information and trends. Okay. Now, th there are times when we're asked to create a report that has elements of all three but they are different. So here's a progress report from the just-in-time training project. And this one's in the book, I, I believe. I'm going to leave you to read it on your own. And that report continued. OK. Um, so. Uh, I think that the challenge in the, uh, to come back here to these reports, the challenge is in traditional project management, the team is expected to report on the status, uh, well, on the status, the progress, and, and to create uh, forecasts. And that um, quite often, that generates a lot of report writing and often they don't get read as often as we would like to see them read. So um, I think that the, the Agile people uh, do less of this and maybe that's a good thing. But uh, I think it's important for people on more traditional teams to make sure that people are reading the reports and that we call out important information so that it just doesn't get kind of uh, lost in the forest and we can't see the, the tree for the forest. Okay, that, that I think is, is a, a typical risk of the kind of reports that get generated from traditional projects. And that what a lot of companies have done is that they've they've gone to these kind of uh, project dashboards where uh, the project manager and team are responsible for uh, characterizing the state of a project as uh, in sort of like traffic light uh, colors, uh, uh, green, yellow, red. Okay, so that. Uh, maybe that's a wake up for somebody to go and start reading the reports if this thing has gone to yellow from green or from uh, red uh, uh, from yellow. All right. Integrated change control. So integrated change control involves identify, evaluating, and managing changes throughout the project's life cycle. Uh, the objectives are influence the factors that cause it changes to ensure that changes are beneficial, determine that a change has occurred, 
manage the actual changes as they occur. Now, um, in the same sense that in when we were talking about risks, we said that there were there's a positive risk and then there is a negative risk. Well, there can be positive uh, uh, changes as well. One of the one of the um, one of the experiences that I've had in these kind of projects is, in terms of uh, positive uh, change is that especially when you're you're designing a and again i apologize if my examples are all in terms of information systems but that's kind of my background so oh, that's where my examples uh, come from but uh if you're going to be doing things uh in a new way when you go to the when you install the solution that comes from the project a lot of times um the if stakeholders are afraid that they don't want to give up the old way. So they'll say, well, you have to build me the new way, but you still have to support the old way. And there are times when you just can't talk them out of it. Okay. And so that's in the plan. All right. But what you want to do, even though that's in the plan, is to convince them as, as you're going through the building of the system, that uh, the new way is going to suffice and that the old way is something that they think they need, but they don't really need. So this is a positive uh, change that can, it can occur whenever you're getting people who are hanging on to old stuff or supporting old stuff that they don't really need and you understand that, but they haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, there's an interesting story about uh, Chicago's Museum of Contemporary Art and their exhibit on David Bowie. I don't think that it really makes the point that they're trying to make, but uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art is a really cool place <laughs> that, that I really like. Uh, and I'm sure that there's something interesting about this whole story, but uh, I don't think that we make the case for that on, on the slide. Okay, scope. Okay, so during monitoring and controlling, we're going to have to monitor and control the scope. Um, the, the main parts of that are validating scope and controlling scope. And the key outputs are accepted deliverables and work performance information. Now, I just want to remind you that this, again, this is all in these uh, PMI curriculum terms. Validating scope means, in these terms, having people uh, examine the outputs, having them inspect the outputs from the team and approve them and sign off on them. Now, why they call that validating scope, I don't really know, but that's what it means in these uh, terms. Um, scope creep. Even when the project is fairly well defined, many projects suffer from scope creep and the tendency for project scope to grow bigger and bigger. Many horror stories around about scope creep. I'm sure you've heard your share. Even for fairly simple projects, people have a tendency to want more. And this last point here, I think, really sums it up. How many people do you know, for example, who said they wanted a simple wedding or a basic new house uh, constructed, only to end up with many more extras than they had initially uh, planned? You see, especially when you're doing something that's important to you, human nature makes the scope uh, grow. It's not that people are evil. It's not that people are greedy. It's very hard to control these things. And um, I like the fact that they picked the wedding and the new home because these are important to uh, couples and families. And 
with all that importance on the line, the next thing you know, the scope just got too big. Scope uh, validation, again, is signing off on the deliverables, okay? Uh, the customer is often more than one person, so you might have to get a sign off from more than one person. And that means that you might have to facilitate a group decision making inspection and an acceptance uh, process. Uh, here's a deliverable acceptance form, okay? That would be the kind of thing you could have on this kind of project. Controlling the scope. You cannot control the scope of a project unless you have clearly defined the scope and set up a scope validation uh, process. So unless you know what you promised and you have a way to get what you promised signed off on, how will you ever know where you are? So you need, you also need to develop a process for soliciting and monitoring changes to scope. Stakeholders should be encouraged to suggest beneficial changes. Again, uh, uh, especially if there's a history of people kind of digging in early on and asking and demanding things that maybe they didn't absolutely need. Well, uh, this is the thing that we could encourage to get back to where we really belong. And of course, we want to discourage them from making uh, unnecessary uh, changes. Um, this story on this slide about Northwest Airlines has been in Kathy Schwalbe's project management of books for a long time, but it's a great story. Uh, Northwest Airline came up with a new reservation system in the 90s. Now, when I began to teach her books, the 90s weren't that far in the, in the past, but now they're 30 years in the past. Uh, but what they did is they built a budget for change into the project plan. And my experience is that this works really well. Um, there's this idea that you hear that waterfall projects only resist uh, change and that it's a mess. And it's not really a mess, and they don't only resist uh, change. There are projects where they build a budget for change, and they engage the stakeholders in the process of managing that change. And this Northwest Airlines story is a good case in point. Okay, so before we talk about schedule, management. I'm going to pause again and I'll be right back. Uh, okay, so project schedule management. The sorry, the main monitoring and controlling process performed is controlling the schedule or schedule control Project managers often cite delivering projects on time as one of their biggest challenges because the schedule problems often cause more conflict than other issues. During project initiation, priorities and procedures are often most important, but as the project proceeds, especially during the middle and latter stages, schedule issues become the predominant source of conflict. Certainly consistent with my experience. Why, why the schedule then? Well, time is the variable with the, with the least amount of flexibility. Time passes no matter what happens. Individual work styles and cultural differences may also cause schedule uh, conflicts. So depending upon, and we talked about a lot of things in prior uh, chapters about uh, personality tests and uh, categorizations. We've also talked about um, uh, cultural differences around the world, okay? And the thing is that uh, different people see time in a different way, uh, depending on where they're from or how they're wired. And so um, 
a lot of opportunity for conflict. So on this slide, we've got some great stories about uh, time and budget in uh, three different Olympics, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Greece, and uh, uh, Sochi and Russia. And the, the experience about how things went uh, with respect to being on a time was different. Um, the budgets, um, you know, the budget uh, variances were different. Um, I, I think that the Olympics are a great case of, 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 of how the, the schedule, the time is just there. It's a hard date. The Olympics are going to happen on a certain date that people are going to show up and they're going to have the Olympics and either you're ready or you're not. Uh, so one of the things that you're going to want to look at is work performance information. Okay. Um, so the goal of schedule uh, control is to know the status of the schedule, influence the factors that cause schedule changes, determine whether the schedule has changed and manage it, it changes when they occur. Key outputs include uh, forecasts and work performance information. One big problem that I see in a lot of uh, big projects that have big schedules and big uh, budgets is uh, sometimes it's unclear what the agreed to schedule and budget are. Um, the budgets uh, tend to get bigger and the schedules uh, tend to get longer. And the team uh, comes back to the stakeholder and says, well, I think this project is going to take another however amount of time and it's going to cost however much more money. And the stakeholders say, well, think about it. OK. All right. So when that meeting's over, what's the schedule and what's the budget? The conservative thing to say is that we still have the original schedule and budget, okay? But sometimes I've seen these things kind of like go on for a long time where uh, the team has told the stakeholders that uh, the schedule and the budget are untenable. And uh, yeah, the stakeholders have not approved a new budget or schedule. So um, just keeping track of what's been approved and what hasn't and what we're reporting against and what we're not reporting against uh, can be a full-time job. Um, if you're using a tool to control your project, like Microsoft Project, uh, this is great. I just have to point out that not only do you have to have your plan in the tool, but you have to keep updating it with actual information. And if you want to control, for instance, the if you want to be able to generate all the reports that we talk about, even earned value management reports, you also have to report the actual cost. OK. So you have to track the actuals. Um, one big issue is that uh, um, the the important uh, parties on a project uh, who could be the managers of the the people who are doing the work, uh, or they could be the uh, customers, the those kind of stakeholders, right? Uh, we don't want to surprise either of those groups of people. One good way to lose your job as a PM is to surprise them. And uh, a lot of people say, well, of course I know that. But what people don't know is that uh, junior project managers will often either hide unfavorable sc schedule or cost problems early on 
uh, or not mm, bring them to light. And the idea is, well, I'm sure it'll get better. And the thing is, it doesn't get better. And then they're more reluctant to share that information when things have gotten worse. And then it gets harder and harder to tell the truth uh, to the point that you can end up with a big surprise in the end. And of course, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people who, who uh, embezzle money and things like that, who, who tell stories about how they did, you know, they thought they were going to pay it back, that they, um, so there is a part of human nature that when things are going bad, that you just expect them to turn around and then you don't tell people the truth. So uh, there is an element of human nature that can get the project manager to not come clean uh, bit by bit as the project goes along and then to get so far behind and telling bad news that the only way out is to give very bad surprises. So my advice is to give all the information every time you report, uh, whether it's good or a little bad or a lot bad. Um, you never want to be playing uh, catch up in terms of uh, telling the important stakeholders the facts about the project. It only leads to bad outcomes. Um, you know what, I, th I think we're going to break here and have this been the end of part one and we'll be back uh, with uh, part two.